Hello, I'm Michael Swinford. Welcome to this edition of the Veteran Voice. Most of us military people at one time or another have had co communication with a recruiter and the recruiting business has changed a lot since I knew it. So we have a couple of guests today that will be explaining the details of recruitment in the 21st century. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Veteran Voice. I have two distinguished recruiters here with me today. Uh, First Sergeant Davis, First Sergeant Callison. Welcome to the studio today and how in the world did you guys end up recruiting? Um, well, uh, we recruit for the state of Kentucky for the National Guard and the Army here. and. Um, Really, I, I started off as a traditional guard soldier, which you hear the, the citizen soldier, the one week in a month and two weeks a year um, for your annual training. Um, I went on uh, deployment, was stationed at Fort Campbell for a while, went overseas to Iraq. And uh, in order to be a recruiter for the state of Kentucky, um, you have to have you know, a good knowledge base about the organization in which you serve and you're going to represent. And uh, you actually have to go on board for it. Uh, we're not necessarily selected. Uh, we're looked upon as our, our peers, as uh, uh, competent individuals to go out and represent the organization properly. And we actually go and we meet with the, the star majors and the battalion and uh, it's a lot like a job interview that you would do out on the street. Um, yeah. Very intense, it took uh, several days and uh, lots of uh, paperwork, but uh, that's how we started off uh, being recruiters. Is it your job to recruit uh, in the sense of um do you, do you lay out a set of options for young people coming to see you in recruitment? Yes, for the most part, our, our objective as counselors is we, we want to focus on what an individual is looking for out of life. And then we try to present a plan that, you know, is appropriate for that individual because all of us have different goals in life, mm -hmm. things they want to do, become, you know, uh, so we kind of tailor it towards them mm -hmm. is our main focus. Well, my first dealings with a recruiter was a long, long time ago. And he told me, he says, now we're going to try to get you in a slot that, you know, it's good for you, good for the Navy. Mm -hmm. But uh, he says, ultimately, it boils down to the good of the nation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, I really want to go here or go there. But I understand the concept that, that the nation's needs comes first. Mm -hmm. Because you guys are out there protecting this nation. And even though you might want to go to Hawaii, they may need you somewhere else. Uh, have you been to Iraq? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about Iraq. Uh, oh, it's hot. Hot. <laughs> Sandy. Sandy. Uh, just a few. Uh, it's a, it was a, a great experience, uh, I believe, honestly, uh, and I think Sergeant Davis will say the same. It was really, uh, I think in America today, we... We have all these the luxuries, and, and you being a Vietnam veteran yourself would understand this. Uh, we we take we take for granted what we have here yeah. today, and it's so easy to do because you haven't seen what a third world country and, and those type of people go through, and, and the terror that they live in, and yeah. and the uh, devastation that you know it's just. Uh, it's Has a, the wreck changed your life? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 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 gave me a, a greater appreciation for life in general. Mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. overall. What do you feel like your service in Iraq and Afghanistan, do you think this is a meaningful thing you're doing or are you just doing it because you follow orders? Absolutely it's meaningful. It's meaningful for the people that uh, we're helping. Mm -hmm. um, you know it was really uh, while I was over there like you said what we take for granted and the luxuries that we have mm -hmm. now uh, here in the states that most people never even think twice about mm -hmm. they uh, like plumbing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we made a difference to those people, and you always hear stories of uh, adversity and, and overcoming that. You know, the boy with the starfish, and he changed that one starfish life by throwing it in, and, and that's essentially what we're doing. It's, it's a big world out there, but uh, I feel privileged. It changed my life, and I feel very good about what I've done for the military. Well, I speak for a lot of veterans, and, and we appreciate what you're doing. 
Uh, if nobody ever steps up, then we as a nation are gone. Do you see any parallels between Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam? Do you, do you see any parallels anywhere? I know it's been in the news, people have been making that statement that, you know, this seems just like Vietnam. Do you see any correlation between the two conflicts? Uh, I, I wasn't there for Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, what I know is in the history books and what I've heard from, from veterans themselves. Um, not so much. I mean, I feel a great, uh, especially where we live here in Western Kentucky, I feel a great pride in, in, in uh, just the people that come up and shake my hand and thank me for my service. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I feel very welcome and uh, it's a good feeling, you know, yeah. especially where we live uh, today. So tell me a little bit about your, your career in the, in the military. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you enlist? Did you go see a recruiter? <clears throat> well, um, to be honest with you, um, Whenever I enlisted, I was with a friend, and uh, he said, "Hey, I need to, I need to go and talk to somebody, and uh, can you give me a ride?" I said, "Yeah, sure." And I never really thought about the military. It was never anything that was thrown out there as an option for me. I never, my family didn't serve, um, didn't have friends in it. But uh, what he was talking to was a recruiter, mm -hmm. and I sat down and I, and he asked me a few questions, and uh, then I started asking him a few questions because um, he started talking about benefits and things like that. And the one thing that he had talked to me about was, uh, you know, my goals. What was my ultimate goal? I said I wanted uh, to continue my education. I want to go to college. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a plan for that. Uh, and he gave me a good plan for that uh, with the guard. And, and that was my initial reason for joining. And once I got in, it was um, I went to basic training, and it just it was like a pair of shoes that just fit mm -hmm. real well. And um, you know, once I done my initial uh, tour of six years when I enlisted, I re-enlisted again. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the guard, you can do 20 years and, and retire, and it's. Did you recruit yourself the second tour? Uh, <laughs> you knew a little bit about uh, it, yeah. And you still say, I was. Uh, I want some more of this. Matter of fact, um, yeah, exactly. I was becoming into the phase of becoming a recruiter, mm -hmm. and uh, just the thought of not putting on the uniform, even if it wasn't for just one week in a month, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't leave it behind. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a part of. It was part of me, and it was part of my life through my my career. It, it uh, definitely influenced the person that I am today. Well, what if I wanted to join the National Guard tomorrow? Of course, I couldn't. But <laughs> in my heart, I wanted to. I tried to reenlist mm -hmm. after the the Gulf War, mm -hmm. on, on the first Gulf War. But they said something very nice that you you can tell somebody they're very old in so many wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I even wrote my congressman. I said I'm not too old, you know. Of course, it's it's up to you, young guys today. Um, what if I want to re-enlist or enlist? What's the first thing you're going to tell me when I walk into your office? First thing, I mean, we're just introduce each other and you know get to know each other and get a feel for what you're looking for. Like mm -hmm. I said before, in life. Uh, I mean, then basically the process is, is not a uh, extremely difficult one. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be lengthy at times and, and feel, uh, you know, like it is. But, uh, I mean, basically just start gathering general information mm -hmm. about you and your history. Uh, you know, there's medical screenings that you have to do just like uh, anything else. Most uh, I refer that to, I mean, certain days usually tell people, anybody involved in sports ever is a, it's typically like taking a sports physical just for high school. Uh, uh, there's aptitude tests as far as the ASVAB, it's still required. Well, uh, what is that? Explain that just a little bit. The ASVAB, yeah. it's just a test the military uses to, I guess kind of like colleges use mm -hmm. the ACT for entrance exam. It's basically the military's entrance exam. Mm -hmm. uh, you test it on various categories. Uh, and that's where he's talking about careers come from, like what you would be best suited for in the military based on your scores on the ASVAB test. So, so you kind of lay out a program in the initial meeting that, that you kind of give these men and women mm -hmm. a clue as to what you can do for them mm -hmm. and, and then you kind of match that up with their goals in life mm -hmm. and out of that you, you should have a good soldier. Yeah, every Everybody is different and you know uh, in the terms of of enlisting and joining the military, people's got one thing in mind, and that's mm -hmm. you know, uh, basic training, get a job, and, and, and stuff like that. But we get so many different people coming to uh, meet with us, you know, that have college degrees, that are in high school, mm -hmm. that uh, are prior service soldiers, and every one of them's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, 
the ASVAB test um, dictates a lot as far as what jobs that they can qualify for. Mm -hmm. um, the physical also comes into um, uh, parts with that. There's a hearing test and stuff involved. In certain jobs, you need to be tip-top on your hearing, and that's what they look for. What are the age limits? What, what age would I have to be if I wanted to join the National Guard? Mm -hmm. Is there a certain age, 18 or what? Um, you can be 17, 17. Um, as long as you're a junior in high school uh, with parental consent. Mm -hmm. um, your parents have to sign off saying that they uh, understand what's going on and that they are for this and all the way up until the age of 42 if you've never been in the military. Mm -hmm. Now if you have uh, served previously in another branch or even the Guard or the Army or whatever, um, you just add the number of years you served to the age of 42. Mm -hmm. So a young person, no, you, you said they were still in school. Mm -hmm. or after they initially enlist, is there a program where they can finish their education before they go on active duty, something like that? Yes, we have we have what's called a RSP uh, that the National Guard designed. RSP is Recruit Sustainment Program, mm -hmm. and what happens there from the time they enlist, say if uh, a new soldier enlists today, we drill one weekend a month. That one weekend a month, we just teach them fundamentals, mm -hmm. basic soldiering skills to prepare them for uh, basic training in the future. Now, if they're currently still in high school, uh, it is their requirement to finish uh, their high school education. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, or if they're a junior in high school, then they would go for the split out program. But either way, they have to be a high school graduate if they enlist as a high school student. So, you know, that requirement's there. Uh, and that's a big concern with parents because think about joining the military sometimes, parents feel like, you know, are we going to ship them away yeah. right away? No, I mean, the, the, you know, it's, their education is important to us. And, uh, I mean, that's what we want them to focus towards. But... The, the, the RSP just gives them that upper edge on basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they practically already know everything that's going on, but, uh, and then they just have to put in a practical exercise when they get to training. How far along in the recruiting process can you say no? <laughs> really? Uh, up to the point uh, that you're fixing to go in and, and uh, swear in. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it official. Now, when you raise your right hand and uh, you affirm and swear to uphold and defend uh, the nation and, and the Constitution, uh, that is uh, essentially the turning point. Mm -hmm. um, and once you're in, I mean, um, you have obligated yourself uh, to the government, uh, to the military. Um, well, that's when the real commitment starts right mm -hmm. then. Right there. Mm -hmm. uh, has the ages or anything changed in regard to the economy? These are hard times mm -hmm. economically. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been an influx of people that have chosen the guard to sort of keep things together and keep their houses and whatnot? Do you see that a lot now? Well, we've seen over the past, we've been doing this now for, uh, actually been field recruiters for the past uh, four years. Mm -hmm. um, there has always been a need uh, for people to benefit from the guard and what we have to offer. Uh, the story has changed a little bit. You know, where somebody come in looking for um, the education, the benefit and stuff like that is a little bit changed where people are coming to us still looking for the education plus the competitive edge to be competitive in the job market. Um, you know, with the education benefits we offer and then the military training, they're able to go to the workforce and um, have that upper hand, you know, competing uh, for a job because uh, so many people, there's one job opening mm -hmm. and they've got to compete with a hundred other people. Yeah. And uh, that's what they're doing to get that competitive edge to be the number one choice for that job. Do, do they ever tell you to slow down on the recruitment? <laughs> do you sometimes just have too many people? I, I don't think we ever slow down. I mean, we're always looking for potential soldiers i mean you know as far as that goes but uh, i mean sometimes there are i guess levels above us that control certain things that influences numbers you know yeah. but do, do you ever send somebody to another service if uh if you thought they'd make a great sailor or marine <laughs> or air force do you sometimes recommend that Oh, absolutely. We're all in the same fight, the right. same country. And, you know, if what's in during our initial phase of, of talking to the uh, potential applicant that they tell us, you know, what they're looking for, and we're not able to tailor that, 
Um, we have uh, relationships built with the other branches and their recruiters mm -hmm. that we're able to call them up and uh, you know I've, I've actually taken people in my car and taken them over there and yeah. introduced them yeah. so that they knew that uh, you know who they needed to but talk to. But this would them. serve the nation better because you're trying to put the right person in the right position to, mm -hmm. to benefit the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, how would a person find a recruiter if he just woke up tomorrow and says, dang, I'm going to join the National Guard and see the world and, and serve my country. How would he find you guys? It, honestly, it's easier now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. I mean, with technology and, and the the way our youth today is so advanced when mm -hmm. it comes to technology. I mean, we're the National Guard and, and most other services are have Facebook pages, uh, right. you know, uh, Twitter, the Guards on Twitter. We have our own web page. Mm -hmm. uh, there's various programs that, you know, link you to a recruiter. Uh, you can go online and chat with somebody that, uh, you know, that was previously in the military to ask questions, uh, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it's, you know, it's, it's just it's, a different world than, yeah, than probably what I knew. Right. It's it's pretty easy to do. Is that made it a little easier on you, though, as far as your job goes by having this technology? Does it help you to t get in touch with people or keep in touch with people? and? Does it make your job a little bit easier? Well, I, th I think so. I mean, it gets you more exposure. It's just like anything else. Uh, the more something is, is heard or, you know, seen, then, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there's mm -hmm. more attention given to it. Yeah. Or, you know. Do you men go into schools and talk to students? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From time to time, we go to a lot of different venues, uh, high schools, colleges, uh, you know, just open career fairs because we are an opportunity for that. Uh, you know, we teach... Um, a few classes about uh, college prep where we really don't even talk about the military just as it is a source to pay for education mm -hmm. but um, you know, we do a lot of different venues trying to get our word out. What's the funniest incident you ever had as a recruiter with the new recruit? Surely there must be one that sticks out in your mind. Hmm. <laughs> mm. Well, I can tell you one. That when I when I went in, okay, we had talked to a recruiter, and I loved it. I was all gung ho like you guys, and I thought, man, I just can't hardly wait. And I, I joined a, a a reserve unit while I was in high school, and I went back and graduated. So it worked out really well for me. Mm -hmm. The problem I had was when I walked up to get my shots to go in. Mm -hmm. They said we had to take seven or eight at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right then, a thought went through my mind, I need to get around, turn around, and go right back out this door. <laughs> but by that time, they were a couple, these weren't recruiters, these were just regular Army people or mm -hmm. Navy people, and, and they decided that they'd hold my arms up to make it easier for me. <laughs> so, But I imagine you do see a wide array of, of individuals. Um, are the ladies being recruited at the same pace that the men are? Is it, is it like a total, is there a percentage you have to work with when you're enlisting women or men? Uh, everybody is, um, is eligible. You know, uh, we don't have a specific target, um, but you know, our door is open to any and all um, that want to come in and volunteer, you know, for the military and for their country. Well, we've heard a lot about uh, enlisting. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest does it make you feel good to recruit somebody is it like a little personal thing with you that that you feel like you've accomplished something and, and you started a young person on a life that may be so beneficial to them in so many different ways does that give you a sense of pride and pleasure to do that I, th I think it I think it does honestly and, and me and Sergeant Davis to discuss this uh, there's a lot of other you know talents that we both possess that you know we could do other things but it's like school teachers, and, and you're, you can see a difference you're making in, in an individual's life, and that's like our legacy of what we're leaving behind here. You know, everybody wants to uh, accomplish, you know, that and the better for our nation and, and uh, long term. I mean, that's, that's, I think, what keeps us going. I mean, there's, there's struggles at times. I mean, we, you know, it's, it can be a stressful environment sometimes, but that's, I mean, we've personally seen you know, young men come in completely turn their lives around mm -hmm. who are, you know, close to graduating college now, going to be successful, you know, citizens for us and soldiers. So, Do you remember when, when they went from a, uh, 
draft selection board to, to bring people in to an all voluntary army where now supposedly everybody is volunteering to go mm -hmm. in. Were it, you there when that transitional period was? When I got in, was during that uh, period. It's a selective service. Uh, the, the ASVAB, the physical, um, you know, you have to pass all of those things in order to be deemed qualified to essentially volunteer. Um, it's laid out as far as your training path, the job that you're going to do. Um, it's laid out right there in the beginning before you ever, you know, uh, raise your right hand and actually uh, commit uh, to that, you know, term of service. So you, do you, you don't have a quota, right? Or do you? A quota for a recruiting? Yeah, do you? I have mean, we have certain guidelines that we go by. I mean, as far mm -hmm. as things that, and it's based on what you talked about, you know, the needs of the nation. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. we, 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 we get that each year, so. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the general command somewhere sends down a memorandum that we need to do this and need to do, need to do that. So mm -hmm. you guys help us a little bit on that. Either. Right. Yeah, it, it may be from, you know, like, Washington DC tells the state of Kentucky, hey, we need, you know, this part from you this mm -hmm. year. So I mean mm -hmm. that's kinda Did you all take part in the ice storm? Were you Oh yeah. <laughs> lifted boxes, huh? <laughs> well we were um since we're essentially the uh, military liaison for the local governments here, we were stationed um at the local city halls all the way from uh, I think our reach was Webster, Crittenden, Livingston and mm -hmm. McCracken County. So basically, um, I was the link for the, the mayor and the judge executive mm -hmm. to the military because they don't understand you know, our rules, regulations, right. or how we do business. So basically, every morning, every evening, we sit down, they discuss their needs, and I relate it out to the field so that the community could get those uh, assets that they needed. Well, this kind of makes the term citizen soldier come mm -hmm. alive then, that, mm -hmm. that you're not just protecting us or you have protected us from within. You know, this mm -hmm. was an act of God, but still, uh, I think on behalf of all the citizens of the surrounding area that we appreciated what you did. I, I had to come to Paducah and, and got one of the boxes of food, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have made it if we hadn't had it. So <clears throat> again, I thank you for, for your service in that area. Uh, what do you anticipate is going to happen in the next five years recruitment? You think there's going to be any major changes or things will pretty well do what they are now? I don't, I don't know if you can ever foresee, uh, I mean, what the needs will be. I mean, we just pretty much, I mean, we're always looking for, like you said before, for the, the next potential soldier that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. fits who, who's wanting to serve and, and benefit uh, from serving their country. So uh, I, it's kind of hard to say, yeah. you know, long term. Uh, as a recruiter, do you get any financial incentive for doing your job? We don't do uh, a lot of people. It's a common question that uh, I talk to a lot of people like, "Will you get extra money if you recruit me?" Well, no. I, I draw a, a salary. You know, I get my base pay yeah. and uh, my housing allowance and stuff for being active duty. Um, there is like drill sergeants, airborne pay, hazard duty pay. We do right. get an additional pay every month, but that comes regardless whether yeah. you enlist or you don't. So. Uh, we don't get any extra uh, well, incentive. I'll see if I can write a letter for you. That <laughs> <laughs> might help. I don't know. Well, there is an incentive for the citizen soldiers that are out there, mm -hmm. the people who are in a referral program um, that they participate in. It's called Guard Recruiting Assistant Program. And, you know, there are uh, close to 8,000 guardsmen uh, in the state of Kentucky currently serving right now. And, you know, they meet somebody that hasn't talked to a recruiter or would like more information and they come and talk to me or you know another golf recruiter mm -hmm. um, and they end up enlisting they receive a two thousand uh, dollar referral bonus essentially so it's another uh, benefit for being that citizen soldier well I would hate to think what our armed forces would be without you guys do you you plan on staying in this as long as you can is this something that you see as a long-term commitment being a recruiter I mean, yes, I would say, you know, for, I don't know that I would, you know, stay a recruiter throughout my whole career, you know, honestly, uh, uh, but recruiting is, you know, it's a passion that I think me and Sergeant Davis both share, mm -hmm. uh, so for, for a few more years, you know, yeah. five, Our, six, uh, we're about 10 years from retirement, mm -hmm. somewhere in that ballpark, so. 
Our next step would actually be to be uh, supervisors to train new recruiters. Uh, so that'll be our next phase of our career. Sounds and like you got a plan. Yeah, we, we're working on it. And, uh, With Sergeant Davis, Sergeant Callison, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure having you here today. This is Michael Swinford. Thank you for joining us today on this edition of the Veteran Voice. Please stay tuned for a special presentation. I'm Michael Swinford. This is the Veteran Voice. Many times our veterans have been asked, why do you serve your country? Why is there such a great deal of patriotism in your actions and your thoughts? And I pondered this question over the past couple of weeks, and I decided to bring to a visual just why we serve our country and why we fight to preserve it. First of all, this is our flag. It's our United States. States of America. We are united under it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. If this flag refuses to fly someday, then we as a people are lost. This is one reason why we fight. Another reason is our Bibles, because freedom means having the right to choose which church or which faith you want to be involved in, or perhaps none at all. But as Americans, we have this freedom to worship as we please. And probably the most important, this is my granddaughter, Leilani Rose Leatherman. She's six months old, and she's the reason that we serve and we fight to protect this freedom. So she says hi, needs a nap, and this is Michael Swinford. This is a veteran voice. See you next time.